Hello, everyone. Oh, thank you all so much for joining us today. We have uh, my good friend, Dr. Jay Shetland, here to talk to us about uh, children and auto accidents in a nutshell. Really, and that really was like about as basic as I could get because this is a man who is incredibly educated and passionate um, when it comes to motor vehicle collisions and patient safety and really the safety of the community. Um, I wish, like, we couldn't do a webinar long enough to really do justice to the amount of knowledge that this man has. Um, not only is he a speaker, he is an author um, working with doctors like yourself, but also working with attorneys, uh, working with insurance companies to really talk about uh, proper diagnosis, treatment, and documentation for auto accident victims. Um, he's actually currently working on some books that are going to be directed toward patients and insurance agents, um, as well as doctors and lawyers, um, to talk specifically about hidden soft tissue injuries that occur during these motor vehicle collisions. Like I said, this is a man who has an unbelievable amount of knowledge. We are so very lucky that he um, was able to make time in his busy schedule at the beginning of the year, because you know me, I like to kick it off with a bang, um, to share some of this wisdom um, and break it down in a nutshell to really help you in your practice when it comes to helping your patients who've been involved in these automobile accidents. So without further ado, Dr. Shetland, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for putting this together so we can uh, reach more doctors to help them help their patients and their their communities. It's going to be a great thing. I hope they pick up some really good gems from today's talk and topic. So we are talking about kids and car crashes, and the pediatric conundrum is what I call it, because so often this is a patient base that is either not just misdiagnosed, but not even diagnosed at all. Patients, don't, Parents don't bring them into the, the office to get the care from the doctors that they need. Uh, just the insurance companies, unfortunately the adjusters, have this weird thought that kids don't get injured in car accidents, yet they sustain the same physical forces that the adults had. And they, they believe, truly believe, that kids just don't get hurt in a car crash. And it's just the craziest thing. So we're going to address this and debunk some of the myths go over some of the research, and uh, go over how to properly use the right protocols that are out there and research guidelines to help validate the care that we're doing for these kiddos so that the insurance companies can learn and understand why they need to care, what, why we're doing what we do, and how valuable it really is to prevent problems down the road, and then you know, how we can actually get paid for doing this. Because you know, the, at the end of the day, we have a business to run. We've got to make sure we're getting fair exchange for treating uh, children as well. So just to move forward on this, this is some of the things we're going to cover today is the me mechanism of injury, the research, and I want to talk about some research with adults and some with kids, of course, because we've got to understand some of the adult stuff that we see regularly in our office to then bridge some gaps and understand more with the, the kids. Some protocols we need to know and then the earning potential for both of those. So statistically speaking, there's 1.5 million motor vehicle collisions per year just in America. We're going to have four during just this lecture uh, that that happens. And there's usually, well, there's always at least one person, a driver, right? But there's usually other occupants. So this ends up with about 3 million injuries per year in our country. Out of all those PI or personal injury cases, half of them have long-term problems and 10% end up with disabilities, meaning they're ruined for life. They're not able to work anymore, all kinds of problems like that. So Touching from kids, we've got newborns all the way up to teenagers. Nationally, motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of deaths for teenagers. Now, this part, the insurance companies do recognize. That's why teenagers have so – we're paying so much more, or our teenagers are paying so much more in their insurance coverage to drive a vehicle as a teenager. But this, this blind area is the injuries from these motor vehicle collisions for teenagers and younger. It's crazy. So let's talk about the anatomy of an accident for just a minute. Hopefully, most of you are familiar with the Croft and San Diego Spinal Research Institute studies and how they did some actual, they videotaped live occupants and crashes where we're crashing cars into each other, measuring the physical forces applied to the human occupants, not just the vehicles. Because 
if we have some expert witness in a case that comes in and says, well, you know, I'm an accident reconstructionist, and here's what I figured out the me measurements were and the physics were, and that is all related to the vehicle. That has nothing to do with the actual occupants. And believe it or not, the occupants actually experience a different set of physics. For example, an occupant, like if we can watch this video here, I'm going to see if we can get this first one started. He's got the larger vehicle versus the smaller vehicle. Two, um, he's still injured and taken out of the study. Three, his head restraint's too low. That's, an, that's a complicating factor that increased injury. And then four, there's no visible damage. So when we've got somebody who's not trained to look at these things properly, they think, oh, well, there's no damage to the car, so the occupant couldn't have been injured. And there's no correlation to damage to vehicle and occupant injury, absolutely no connecting data or research on that. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. So then we look at something like a little kid. If you can see the slide that I'm still showing, we've got to see a little kid here in a, a car seat. Well, if we imagine a little kid in the car seat in the back of that incident that we just witnessed, we're, we're taught to keep these kids rear-facing as long as we possibly can. Let's show the next video. This one does have sound, and then we'll come back to this. So let's let's just break that down for just a moment. If we, it's pretty logical stuff if you're able to hear the the discussion on that of keeping kids rear facing as long as possible and how it distributes the forces more evenly in a frontal impact collision. True. I mean, I don't argue with that at all. But what we neglect to understand or or take a look at is well, what if the kid is in a rear facing car seat and is rear ended, which most of the patients that are going to present. Statistically, more patients are going to present to the chiropractic office after being rear-ended than in a frontal impact. So then you're thinking, well, well, now what do I do with this little kid? Well, if you can imagine what they just showed us and put the car seat in the back seat of that black sedan from the video we watched before that, but turning it around where it's rear-facing, there's a lot of forces transferred to that little child, and their body is all strapped down, and their head, which is a third of their, their body, is now at the mercy of these physics. Well, that gentleman, he experienced 13 G-forces in his head in this low-speed collision, meaning his average human head of 10 pounds weighed 130 pounds in that short time it moved uh, in the opposite direction of its body three times in a split second. So for a child, uh, their head is a third of their body size and their whole body strapped down and they get in a rear impact collision, there's a lot of room for injury there. But sometimes the kids don't elicit the symptoms that trigger the parents to bring them in right away. Or the parent doesn't correlate, oh, this kid's not latching on when breastfeeding anymore. They don't correlate that to the accident, or the motor vehicle collision. I, I should, we should call them motor vehicle collisions. They're not accidents. Um, usually they're, uh, the reason that we have a motor vehicle collision is 
at the fault of somebody not paying attention or not doing something right. So they're they're rarely an accident. They're usually a negligent uh, a negligent happening. So anyway, this this kid now is maybe not sleeping as well or is crying more often or is not nursing as well. A lot of times the parents just don't put two and two together. And, and sadly, the pediatricians don't have training in this stuff. So it's a great opportunity to have lunch with pediatricians in your area and teach them some of these, you know, the physical forces that are applied to a child in a, in a motor vehicle collision and whether or not there are listening symptoms, as we're going to discuss here in a minute, it's, they still have the need for care to prevent future problems. So if we, if we continue from here, Here we can see this kid in this rear-facing car seat. Cute little kid, but uh, man, that, that's a big head compared to that body that's just at the mercy of physics. Now, for a side impact, you know, they're, they're pretty well protected in these car seats. That frontal impact, yeah, it distributes that weight very evenly. But if it's a rear-end collision, they're, they're still very susceptible to injury. And these injuries cause joint instability and lead to degenerative changes. In fact, the research shows that they can be permanent injuries and cause permanent impairment. And we might not be able to see it in, a, in just a brief evaluation or a parental evaluation of the child. We need to do these things right. Now, on our part, it's much tougher to evaluate a little child. It's harder to take x-rays and sometimes not even possible to take the x-rays on them. But there's still things we can do to help document properly, um, present the right research to, to the parties involved that need to to have that research and still provide treatment that can prevent a lot of problems and save trouble in the future. Let's just do some, some visual breakdown here. This is a, it's facing the wrong direction of the accident. So if we were to say this was the neck of the gentleman in the black sedan that was rear-ended, it's unfortunately facing right instead of left and it's got a reverse curve, which we know that's not great, but it, it, it's a really nice illustration showing how here's a cervical spine with bones and muscles and ligaments. And when, we are rear-ended and our head hyperextends over that head restraint. We want to make sure those head restraints are up high enough and train our patients to put those head restraints up high enough that we prevent that hyperextension. Because it's easy for soft tissue tears to show, to uh, present, like a torn anterior longitudinal ligament or the um, deep anterior cervical muscles. And those don't show up on x-ray, of course. Uh, they only show up on MRI, maybe, but yet those can definitely be injured, and if they're not rehabbed properly, lead to some big problems. When we flex forward then, and the seatbelt engages, stopping our torso and our head now, weighing quite a bit more than normal under these G-forces, hyperflexes forward, we can tear posterior longitudinal ligaments, interspinous muscles, and uh, really cause some, some deep soft tissue injuries that we just can't visibly see, capsular ligament tears. Now, I don't have any pictures to share with you. This is uh, Probably going to share this in the next upcoming seminar, but <clears throat> for those of you that are Back to the Future fans, I, ha I happen to have been a, a happy DeLorean owner for a time until I was rear-ended by an ambulance <clears throat> on the freeway, totaling a time machine. Sad day. But uh, the, the soft tissue injuries that I sustained actually allowed my ligaments and flavum to just fray and pinch the spinal cord where it caused momentary paralysis of both upper and lower extremities where I was paralyzed at the scene. So there's some scary stuff that can happen. And there was, you know, you look at the back of the car, the front of the car is completely demolished because it caused a second accident. Um, but the, the back of the car doesn't even look that bad considering how heavily we were hit. So we've got to understand damage to vehicle, visible damage to vehicle, correlation to injury to occupant. There is, there is no correlation. So when we look at it on the x-rays, well, what do we see every day in, off, in the office? We can see, well, is there a good cervical curve like we see on the left? And we can see this little cartoon disc that's happy because it's with the proper alignment, there's not undue wear and tear on the discs or joints. Versus the right side where we see loss of curve and now we're putting some undue stress on the disc. If we leave that alone, subluxations, we deal with that all day every day, then it starts to dehydrate because the research shows that after the age of 15, we don't have a good blood supply to our discs and joints. They only get their nutrients through movement. So for these kids, they respond so much faster when we are giving them proper chiropractic care and treatment after a motor vehicle collision or soft tissue injuries because they had the blood vasculature to help them by their body heal faster with the, the work we're already doing for them. So it's pretty miraculous how quick these kids can bounce back. But if we leave it alone, it just continues to degenerate and then spread. It's important for all of us to be able to tell, our, to tell or teach our patients that 
degeneration, like spinal degeneration, arthritis, it's not part of growing old. It's trauma or dysfunction in the joint <clears throat> over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is critical because when these kids have these injuries and they're not rehabbed properly, they're going to start getting arthritic changes happening in their late teens, early 20s, and that's just so unnecessary. I mean, what a, what a nightmare for that. So, so uh, with that said, let's go look into some of the adult research. We've got Punjabi points out that for adults, they took six cadavers and they put them in a car crash and they rotated their spine and then uh, the impact was at 3.5, 5, 6, and 8 G-forces. And what they found was that with as little as 8 G-forces, there was absolute for sure injury. So now remember we saw from that other thing, he experienced a 9.9 mile an hour crash. The change of velocity was six miles an hour. The G-forces were 13 Gs applied to the head of the gentleman in the black sedan. So miles per hour and G-forces don't exactly relate perfectly. For example, using my case again, small 2,700-pound vehicle struck by a 14,000-pound ambulance, they don't have to be going that fast. And, I'm, and I experienced a great deal of G-forces um, regardless of what the speed was. So there's a lot of variables that we, we need to study if we're going to be a certified auto accident specialist to really be able to, um, to black belt this stuff. But we can get pretty good at it just from, you know, some little – conversations like we're having today. Um, I do <clears throat> recommend the Physician's Guide to Whiplash and Hidden Soft Tissue Injuries. That is one of the books that I've written that helps address these physical forces as well as uh, looking at the legal medical aspect of us beginning a case with the end in mind so that we diagnose and document properly to help the attorneys in the case because they can't do their job right if we don't do our job right. Some more research. Females, this is according to... Um, to Croft and Culligan, female drivers were three times more likely to be injured than a male driver in a whiplash or acceleration deceleration collision. So when we look at the other studies on that, one from Friedman and Croft and another one from uh, from Bio, uh, Journal of Biomechanics in 2007, it's pointing out that men have more muscle mass in their neck by about 15%, which is what reduces our likelihood of injury compared to the women, making women three times more susceptible to injury than, than men. It's pretty crazy stuff. So as we get into the pediatric research, so let me make sure I just made that clear on the last one. So you've got a guy and a gal in the same car accident, same physical forces, yet the female's more likely to be injured than the male, even though they experience the same forces. So we've got to look at the, each individual patient uh, each, each patient individually. So when we're looking at the pediatric patient, the most common cause of serious pediatric spinal trauma is motor vehicle traffic incidents. This is uh, uh, Spine Journal 2007. That's funny because the, the adjusters say, well, kids aren't injured in car accidents. Come on, they're all perfectly fine. They're just little, you know, Nerf kids. It's like they just they just absorb the forces just fine. Well, that's not true. That's not how it works. Just because they don't elicit symptoms right away or we don't recognize the injuries doesn't mean they don't get injured. It also points out that the zero to four year age group, so again, we're going from zero up to, to 16 or 18, has the highest portion of serious injuries, 47% in this group. Pretty big. This is important. Children who sustain minor injuries and are not brought to the hospital, but rather see a general practitioner, pediatrician or GP, um, they're not included in the, the sample data. And therefore, the minor injuries are way underreported. So if we're trying to look at, oh, was somebody hurt seriously, somebody killed, somebody hurt seriously, somebody had received minor injuries, there's a huge gap in what's actually reported in the minor injury category. So... If we step back and look at this slide, we can go, oh, well, if I was an adjuster and I didn't know, I'd never heard the research from Spine that says traffic accidents are the biggest cause of this, and all the, the minor injuries are underreported, we can see why they start to think, oh, yeah, kids just aren't hurt in, in motor vehicle collisions, but they are. And so we've got to bring it to their attention by in our reports quoting the research and helping them understand. Okay, the best comparative research, and this is stuff that I put together over the decades and what led me to me writing this book, 
is auto accident spinal injuries for kids, the best comparative research is shaken baby syndrome. A motor vehicle collision is because a trauma happened in a car. Shaken baby syndrome is somebody didn't accidentally or there was some sort of negligence on the road. Somebody purposely picked up a child and created a cervical acceleration deceleration injury. So if we're looking at this, comparing some of the research, it's, it's interesting how some of the numbers overlay and we have to kind of fill in the gaps with the reasons we just talked about with uh, not understanding because some of them aren't reported, so things are underreported. But of the total number of spinal injury cases found in the, in the study over here on, uh, from Spine 2007, 30% were classified as serious and 70% were classified as minor. Now, your and my definition of serious and minor are pretty different from the medical one. So some's the same. I mean, we would all consider a broken bone serious. Uh, but they're looking at subluxations, not from the chiropractic definition, but a subluxation in the spine where the joint is physically fully dislocated. Uh, so the, to, those, to them, those are serious. Uh, minor, I don't know what they're classifying as minor. They don't even classify subluxations the way we look at them as anything, really. I mean, they just unfortunately don't, don't value that. But then we look at uh, reviewing some shaken baby syndrome articles. The mortality can be as high as 30%, and up to 70% of the survivors suffer long-term impairment, which is pretty serious. So shaken baby syndrome is interesting because we've been using these similar terms for, the, for decades with cervical acceleration or whiplash. So a number of anatomical features are what make it why kids are particularly vulnerable to acceleration deceleration events, especially if there's a rotatory component, which in shaken baby syndrome, typically these kids don't have the, the muscle tone to hold up their head or try to fight and resist when a person is shaking them violently uh, front and back. So because their head is so large in relation to their body and they have those weak muscles, that is a big cause of injury with shaken baby syndrome. Same thing in a motor vehicle collision, especially from the pictures that you saw earlier, where if a kid's strapped in and the impact is a, is caught, if it's a rear impact and they're rear facing, or it's a forward impact and they're in a forward facing seat, as those videos that we showed earlier, you can see a tremendous amount of force is transmitted through the neck of the child as the torso and the head are you know, whipped in the same direction. So we've got to, we've got to think about this thing from a, a both as a doctor from the patient's perspective, but we also have to be like a physics teacher and an a accident reconstructionist relating to the patient, not the car, and really break this thing down so that we can better explain it to adjusters and to parents and, um, and to attorneys. So there we are again with the car seat, and you can see uh, if it's a rear facing and it's a frontal impact, yes, true, it does help distribute the energy, but on a rear impact, they're in big trouble. Now, this is an important concept that I address in the book, where as infants and as we're growing, our bone to disc proportion is about 50-50. So there's a, there's a lot of space in there for swelling before we're actually going to have compressive forces on the nerve roots uh, or, the, or the spinal column. So in the adult, we're going to sh elicit symptoms much quicker, much easier, because there's not as much space in between uh, discs and facet joints before we're going to have inflammation putting in some sort of uh, secondary pressure on a nerve root or, a, or the spinal column. And, of course, we're more susceptible to injury like a disc injury or bulge just because we're older and tissues are starting to get more tired. We're just not as elastic as these young kids. But that doesn't mean they're... Uh, you know, superhuman, and they're not going to get injured at all. This is a, some important research. Uh, again, spine 2007, delay or faulty treatment leads to adhesions about the facets, so in the joints, and scarring about the capsular ligaments, a persistent spasm, uh, congestive lymphedema, fibrosis of the muscles, swelling, uh, even affecting the nerve root. So the resultant faulty posture. And it, anyway, what we're going on with this is if we have these problems and they're left alone, they're going to lead to degenerative changes that will be visible on x-ray years later, and that's known as traumatic arthritis. So 
that's why it's important that we treat these kids early. It's a proactive step. It's a preventative step, even if they're not eliciting symptoms at the time, so that they don't develop arthritic and permanent problems early in their, uh, their young adulthood. So this is a really cool case study, and this is also rec uh, discussed in the book. We've got three case studies that were all involved in a motor vehicle collision. One gal on the, on the far left here had a motor vehicle collision a year ago, and she said, oh, yeah, I came, she came in for chiropractic care and said, I'm too busy with life and school. I can't do care right now. A year later, she came back with the symptoms bothering her enough that she decided to continue with care. We can see these are pretty small images, but you can see that there's a, a line drawn with a curve where her neck should be, and it's pretty straight or loss of curve. Very common. Now, honestly, and in fairness to society, in the last 15 years with all these computers and now the, the little handheld games that kids are holding, the repetitive microtraumas are causing a lot more people in our population to have loss or reverse cervical curve. Honestly, before 15, 20 years ago, you would rarely, rarely see this unless it was a big injury like a football whiplash or a car accident. Uh, but in fairness, these studies are are older. And uh, the, the second one, she was in a motor vehicle collision five years prior. Same story, was busy with school and life, didn't get any care. Five years later, she came back with radiculopathy and headaches and neck pain and finally started doing her care. And we can see the, the reverse curve going on. Still has good disc spaces, but there is definitely a loss of uh, a reverse curve that's problematic. The third person, um, car accident 10 years ago, we can visibly see arthritic change in her spine and a grossly reversed cervical curve there. What's fascinating about all three of these patients is they're only 25 years old. So all three of them are the same, year, the same age. One had an accident when she was, or motor vehicle collision when she was 24, one she, when she was 20, and one when she was 15. So at 15, she's just a young kid in the car, doesn't even have her license yet. Uh, parents say, oh, you're fine, you're a kid, you'll bounce back, or she's thinking I'm fine, I don't have any injuries, and yet the degenerative changes and problems started from that point, or you would not have degenerative arthritis in your spine as a 25-year-old uh, young adult. That's just unheard of. So we've got to recognize that these degenerative changes start at the point of impact. And so if we aren't doing something to intervene and help these kids uh, get the care they need early, like the research was showing, we've got to innovate early, then it's going to lead to problems that they don't deserve to have early on. So we've got, we want to be proactive. And the best way to do that is just be educated so we can help educate our community. So when we do have soft tissue injuries like re that cause a reverse curve in the spine, our spine degenerates six times faster than normal, meaning we shouldn't really die with arthritic change in our spine. It's not part of growing old. It's trauma or dysfunction in a joint that leads to arthritic change. But when we get those traumas when we're younger, that's when we start seeing degenerative arthritis in our spine in middle, middle age or, or uh, old age. So to sum it up with some of the research before we move on to a few of the other cool things we're going to talk about today, um, the most common accidental cause of serious pediatric spinal trauma is motor vehicle traffic incidents. So yes, kids do get injured in car accidents. The adjusters are way off course on that. Traffic-related incidents account for approximately one-third of all spinal traumas and half of serious injuries. That's big. Spinal injuries were classified as serious if there were fractures, spinal cord or vertebral subluxation disorders, major ligament injuries. These are considered serious in the, the research articles. Of the age groups 0 to 16, 0 to 4 had the highest proportion of serious injuries. So honestly, even in those little car seats, they're the most, most susceptible to the big injuries because those their head to body portion and those muscle the strength of those muscle tissues is just it's, it's way out of whack and it just leaves them susceptible to injury. Now SBS or um, <coughs> excuse me shaken baby syndrome is non accidental it's a non accidental version of a cat injury or whiplash injury. Mortality and morbidity rates are pretty high. Matter of fact, they're the same as motor vehicle collisions in that group. Those are those do overlay. Uh, shaken baby syndrome has been defined as an acceleration, deceleration, or whiplash injury since 1971. Again, that's another reason why the the research overlays so well, since we don't have people putting their kids in car accidents like Croft and the Spinal Spinal Research Institute of San Diego did for those adults in that first video we showed. Nobody's going to put their kid in a study like that. <laughs> to measure the physics applied to a child. A shaken baby syndrome and whiplash are worse with a rot 
rotation component. It's very common. I mean, you see with the car seats, we try to put those nice pads around the head to keep them from turning their head too much. It's all great in theory. In reality, you know, kids wiggle around so that the rotation can happen. A large number of head to body, the large head to body ratio combined with the immature weak neck muscles really increase the likelihood of injury for, for uh, newborns and under the age of two. Rapid shearing forces are hazardous to the neck muscle and muscles and ligaments and dura mater. I mean, let's face it, we are designed for compressive forces, walking, running, jogging. We are not, com we're not designed for a three, four, five thousand, six thousand pound bullet vehicle to strike us and suddenly have a shear force uh, horizontally through our spine. It's just, we can't handle that. That's why we're injured in such a low velocity um, collision. For example, more people are injured in low speed collisions than in high speed collisions, statistically speaking. Uh, just because it's a low speed collision doesn't mean we don't get injured. Abrupt deceleration with impact increases the chance of injury, of course, and severe visible injuries prompt the parents to have the children seen by a doctor sooner, but if it's not looking too serious, they wait or delay or don't do anything. And that's where we need to educate patients that are coming in, as the adult patients coming in, asking them, was there anybody else in the motor vehicle collision, You know, any passengers you had? If you had kids, let's get them checked as well. <clears throat> Low brainstem injuries may not be noticeable at first, but can be fatal over time. If we have slow onset swelling, which can absolutely happen, that's why with soft tissue injuries, and let's just address this really quick. Again, attorneys don't understand sometimes. Nobody in the insurance industry, either they, I don't know if they don't understand it or they just neglect it, but they all classify, and in, in our emergency room doctors, oh, it's just whiplash. It's just a soft tissue injury. Hello, every tissue in your body, except your bones, is soft tissue. So if we've got a brain injury, that's a soft tissue injury. If we've got a spinal, a brain stem injury, that's a soft tissue injury. We've got blood vasculature injury or ligament or, or tendon injuries, muscle injuries. These are, they're all important. All of these tissues are important. Glandular tissue. So we don't want to just downplay soft tissue injury or whiplash, which of course, in the literature or in our reports, we should use cervical acceleration, deceleration injury. We don't, we don't want to use the term whiplash. It's more of a layman's term. Um, it's great for marketing and for just conversation like this, but not for legal documents. <clears throat> so soft tissue injuries are serious. We don't want to just downplay those. Many of the soft tissue injuries go unnoticed, and that can lead to problems later. Uh, each child's case is individual. As a matter of fact, every patient's case is individual. So we need to look at the parent and the, the child individually when we work them up and, and diagnose and treat. But if we delay or undertreat, and that's typically us, uh, th then it leads to degenerative problems. We're the only ones that can help stop the degenerative problems. I mean, we know that a child aspirin to help the kids sleep better or whatever isn't going to do anything to help with preventing degenerative changes in the joints and in the spine. So we that's us. We've got to step up and help out with that. So let's talk about some research on frequency and duration. And then if time permits, we'll go over some of the protocols and just some payment examples for adults and for kids when we're doing motor vehicle collision um, compensation for our services. There's a research from back to the 50s till current going over how often somebody should be treated after a motor vehicle collision. Now, I want to point out other than the 1992 Mercy document, these are all medical doctor written reports in journals. 1953, billing after a motor vehicle collision, a whiplash injury, they should be treated for several months, three times per day, and then three times per week. Now, just to be clear, medical doctor wrote this. He's talking about the physical medicines, which in my definition is chiropractic, physical therapy, and massage. We're treating the actual soft tissues that are injured. We're not just palliating the symptoms with... Uh, pharmacology or, you know, those kind of things. We know this isn't billing saying, come see the medical doctors three times a day and then three times a week. He's talking pro probably physical therapy in 1953, but it overlays to us perfectly. You've got to do frequent soft tissue re-education following a trauma, for sure. In 1958, start early. There it is again. We, want, we don't want to delay treatment. And we're going to do daily for two to three weeks and then three times a week for however long. 
sometimes the, the insurance companies will argue with us, like, oh, even with the Croft guidelines, oh, why do they need to come in daily for two weeks? That's just – you're over-treating. You've, you've seen somebody more than six visits. You're obviously over-treating. They shouldn't need more than six visits to get better. We've got plenty of research uh, docs that back us up on why we do what we do and why we do it as often as we do and why that is important. In 1978, Dr. Jackson, highly respected uh, doctor, medical doctor, daily for one to two weeks and three times a week. Uh, the Mercy guidelines, we'll address that a little later. Those came out from chiropractors, but it was, it was low back focused. It uh, doesn't apply to the neck at all. And it really doesn't apply to car accidents but we'll, or motor vehicle collisions, but we'll go with that. And then uh, here we're looking at some duration. In 1994, they're like, yeah, it's two months to two years worth of treatments they're going to need, an average of seven months. So if we're treating somebody for four to six or seven months, happy day. We're right in there where we need to be treating people. I mean, granted, when we get over a year or two years, the insurance company doesn't understand what we're doing. Maybe we don't understand what we're doing. The lawyers definitely don't understand what we're doing. But there's plenty of research to back up doing extended care for those that really need it. A really serious injury, if we were looking at the Croft guidelines, which we'll address in a minute, if it's a grade four or five, they're going to need more than just a few months. It could be a couple of years. But we've got to be able to back that up. We can't just like, well, it's my opinion based on, you know, whatever. We've got to have some sort of backing besides what we think. Uh, we're getting a little low on time here, so let's go ahead and um, – oh, I guess we're still doing okay. Got some people. Let's go ahead and go over some treatment protocols here. There are, there are a few out there that are used regularly for us and against us. The Neurological Institute guidelines, the Mercy guidelines, the Quebec Task Force guidelines, and the Croft guidelines. Just to sum this up, to, to make this a little quicker for us, doctors, the Croft guidelines are the most widely accepted guidelines in the world, 37 states and nine countries and growing. And it, there's a lot of, I hear some chiropractors and I hear a lot of attorneys that will kind of poo-poo on the guidelines. These are our best tool to help justify and, and uh, validate the care that we're providing, why we're providing it for so long and why the, the patient needs it. Dr. Croft has done such a great job over the last 30 years putting together research, taking the old medical research, putting together with new chiropractic research, crashing cars into each other so we could measure the physics applied to human bodies. There is nothing else out there that's, that's more non-biased and professionally done than the Croft guidelines to help give us guidance. The Neurological Institute guidelines, these are the things that you'll see at the emergency room. When a patient comes and sees you after going to the emergency room, it's, these neurologists have come up. I, I don't know why they've implemented this guideline to soft tissue or, or motor vehicle injury collisions, but they have, and I'll go over that in a second. The Mercy guidelines, totally for the low back, have nothing to do with the neck. Uh, you can use them. I wouldn't recommend it, but if you know how to use them, you can use them uh, for low back injuries. And then the Quebec Task Force guidelines, these were made by the insurance company in Canada. So A, they're very biased because they're from the insurance company, and they consider somebody fully healed that they can get back to work. B, they're from a different country, and don't apply to our, our systems and our insurance, so they're completely useless when somebody just tries to use it against you in, in court. Let's kind of jump ahead here a little bit. These neurological guidelines, you will see those. These should sound pretty familiar to you. When somebody comes in after going to the emergency room, oh, well, we did a workup. They usually barely, if any, touching of the patient at all. But they'll prescribe medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, antidepressants, muscle relaxants. On occasion, they'll tell them to use a cervical collar that they can wear for two to three weeks. Now, we all know that the research has debunked that. They should, nobody should ever be wearing a brace for more than 72 hours because the longer we're bracing something when it's inflamed, the more scar tissue is building up to then stabilize it in a, in a, a mal position. So that's – this stuff is old school, and yet it's still going on. And why does it have anything to do with the motor vehicle collision? I have no idea. After two to three weeks, if the patient returns to the emergency room, which I certainly hope they wouldn't, but some do, another $1,500 to walk in the front door. They're going to say, oh, well, either let's do this again, or why don't you go do some range of motion exercises with the physical therapist? Uh, why aren't they referring to us? I mean, we're the black belts at this stuff. We've got to make better relations and inroads to, to the emergency medical facilities and the urgent care facilities to understand when somebody's injured in a motor vehicle collision, we are their number one best best first step to move forward. 
The Mercy guidelines, let me just skip over those, other than pointing out that uh, they've been reviewed by Dr. Murphy, and he's figured out ways to jump in there and really validate care over the 12 visits that most of the attorneys try to use these against us and, and debunk our care. I, I jokingly use this picture where you have like a Yerman Thummim or some sort of magical, mystical goggles to decipher them. But if if you uh, study the way Dr. Murphy went through them, you can justify care if somebody's got a, a low back injury in a motor vehicle collision, why, they, why it's a complicated case. And if it's a complicated case, then it justifies care. But honestly, the Mercy guidelines are neither for motor vehicle collisions nor for the neck, so they are tough to use in, in there. Quebec, uh, sponsored by the insurance company, is not great. But what, what I do like about them is they came up with classifications, classifying and grading injuries, though not everybody's just cookie cutter the same. But their whole focus is to get somebody back to week in a short period of time and as soon as they're back to work, um, excuse me, get them back to work in a short period of time, as soon as they're back to work, they're, they're done. Uh, that is a really sick and wrong version of maximum medical improvement. Crop guidelines, best thing we've got going for us right now. I love how they come up with types of injury. Was it a front impact, side impact, rear impact, rollover? What happened in the in the vehicle? What did the occupant experience? Let's grade their injuries. Grade one through five, which I'll break these down in just a second. But uh, spoiler alert, the most common you're going to see in your office is probably going to be a grade three seconded by a grade two. Kids that we've been discussing through the course of this, hands down, grade one, grade two. Okay, stages. When are they presenting to the office? Because if, if they're presenting to the office after six months from their accident, one, uh, it makes it a complicated mess with the insurance, but two, they've got all this scar tissue that's been forming, and now your job is twice as hard as it would have been had they presented early, and it's not going to get near the results as quick as you or the patient would like. Uh, complicating factors. These are huge. We talked about a couple of them when we looked at the gentleman who was rear-ended in the black sedan. His head restraint was too low. That's a complicating factor. There's no visible damage to his, his bumper, his vehicle, which means all of the force of that red Honda in motion transferred directly from frame of the Honda to frame of the black vehicle directly into the occupant because there was no crush or crumple zone, no airbags, none of those things deployed to help reduce the acceleration over time and space of the occupant within the vehicle. In fact, if you look at it again, his seat loads like a springboard or a diving board, launching him forward so his body actually is accelerating faster than the vehicle itself when the seatbelt engages, stops his torso and his head whips forward. These are complicating factors that take some training to learn how to recognize and then utilize. So on the Croft research, uh, I'm sorry that's difficult to see in the yellow, but this Grade one, minimal injury, no limitations of range of motion, no ligament injury, no neurological symptoms. So this basically says, look, folks, I was in a motor vehicle collision. I have a pulse, and I was in a wreck. I deserve some treatment, even with no symptoms. So we do have justification or, or, or leverage here through the research, from what I've already quoted before and with the Croft research, of doing some treatment to help these kids proactively avoid problems down the road, even if they're not eliciting symptoms. Uh, grade two, slight injury. There are some symptoms showing up. Grade three, a moderate injury. Now, when we say moderate, I, I still think this is pretty, pretty severe. If there's ligamentous instability, if you are taking x-rays, as you should be after any motor vehicle collision, you should be doing a seven-view Davis series, overlaying flexion extension and doing measurements so that you know if there's ligament instability because that automatically increases the grade. If, without that, it's hard to know if, for sure if they're a grade three. If you don't have that and there's neurological findings, yeah, you can, you can bump it up to a grade three, but how do you back that up in court if you don't have any visible, measurable, objective uh, evidence to show that besides your exam? It's just adding layers, of, layers and layers of proof in the pudding of why you're doing what you do, why you came to the diagnosis you came up with, and why you're doing the treatments that you're doing. Again, the most common we'll see in the office is a grade uh, three. The most common we'll see for kids is going to be a grade one. But at least we've got something uh, research back to treat these patients and, and uh, justify the care we're doing for them. Justify is not the right word. Uh, 
validate, I guess it would be a better word. So let's do the math. And if we're doing all this extra work of documentation, which that's what we teach at the Whiplash Group and at our seminars and, and to our members, is how do we better document? And then if we document better, how does that help us increase our income better? So let me just say this. A minimal exam, if we're seeing a kid, should be at least $85. A detailed exam for an adult or if it's a teenager and you're having to go into more serious exam because it's not just a simple case. They actually have in, you know, injuries and, and uh, symptoms and stuff. 203. If you're doing your x-rays, you're looking at 165. Now, these are based on relative value scales in my state. Every state is different, and your relative value scales might be quite a bit higher. And I always keep my fees below the relative value scale so there's no argument of I'd rather, I'd rather charge – less and treat the patient more to make sure that I can meet those Croft guidelines as best as I can so that they have less residual problems in their future. I think this is a service that, you know, it's a personal choice for you and your practice, but some doctors charge the max they can charge and see the patient as little or as infrequent as possible, rack up a big bill and then kick them out the door. And personally, I think that's very unethical. We're not treating the patient, we're treating the insurance company. <clears throat> I would rather... Uh, make sure the fare is a reasonable fair exchange, but be able to treat that patient long enough that they have a, a long-term benefit and we still get paid fair for our services. So again, you're, in your state, these might be different. Let's say you take some lumbar as well. If you do a grip strength test separately, uh, if we take a, gri a grip strength test separately and a measured range of motion separately, you can still keep it in that 992 03 range, which is the $203 exam, and then add these in there. Uh, for training on that, we can answer some questions later. But that way you're getting paid fair for your services and you're you're doing the right tools to help come up with that, those objective findings, which validate to the insurance company and the attorneys uh, for proper reimbursement for your services. And then uh, I wouldn't recommend ever tr adjusting somebody day one after a motor vehicle collision. But if after the exam you feel like, you know what, say for them to do an exam and you have mas or a massage and you have a massage therapist in your office, you can get paid very well for having them have a massage at your facility. You know, your massage therapist is going to cost you 40 bucks an hour or so, 50 bucks an hour, and you're, you're making you know, 180 or so for the, the massage. It's good stuff. And your patients love it because they feel like you did them a nice service day one. They just go crazy for that. So that adds up to you know almost 800 bucks for your initial day or, uh, of your workup. Now, personally, and I won't go into this today, we don't have time for it, but I recommend you write up a very good detailed report based on what your findings were on day one, because if you don't have a good report written up to pave the way for the rest of the case, you're, you're setting yourself up to then actually have your fees hacked and stuff. So you, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So what you want to do is write a good report. Some people think, oh, it's so much time and it costs me so much time and I don't, you know, I don't get paid for doing a report. It, it depends. If you do the report, you're getting paid very well through the course of your cases because you're gonna, your case averages are going to go up on what you're getting paid. So it, it still works out where you get paid for it. Um, I've got other, some other tips on that I can go over with you another time. But even for the little kids, if we're doing a brief exam or a very little focused exam and you start doing some gentle treatment for these kids with or without x-rays, which – you know, if you can x-ray them, great. But if they're young and wiggly and stuff, sometimes you can't do that. But you can work with the pediatrician and see what other diagnostic stuff they did. And you get paid for reviewing records. So if they see the pediatrician and you get a copy of their records and you review them before you treat, you get paid for that. Uh, there's a lot of great ways that we can do this where we're providing outstanding service. And honestly, once we start providing the outstanding service, the outstanding income starts pouring in. So it, it's a win-win. When we look at the research, uh, according to the Croft guidelines, a grade one allows daily for a week, three times a week for one to two weeks, two times a week for two to three weeks, and one time a week for up to four weeks. A max of 10 weeks, a max of 21 visits. Now, it's not a free pass like, oh, you're a grade one, you're 21 visits. You've got to do a workup diagnosis and come up with something. You've got to use your doctorly due diligence besides just using the form. And that's what we we teach people at the Whiplash Group and in the, the Personal Injury Training Institute that we the the courses that we tra train people in personal injury. Again, the most common you're going to see the grade three, 56 weeks. It's a year's worth of care up to 76 visits. Just to insider share with what we do, because we combine chiropractic, physical therapy, massage, we're usually able to get people 
uh, at a grade three, doing pretty amazing on average in about 44 to 50 visits. Uh, we don't go over that unless we have an MD that looks at them as well, that is also trained and certified in personal injury stuff and says, oh yeah, they definitely need more care. They are not out of the woods yet. To just try to maximize these, it, it's with one one voice saying this is what they need, it's harder. But when we have two, we have a physical therapist or a medical doctor also touching the patient and documenting injury, it increases the the strength of the case for an attorney and it increases the validity for everybody that's treating because it's not just uh, one person screaming from the rooftops, it's two or three. <clears throat> Hopefully that's helpful. This is a really important one I wanna address. A lot of the attorneys that you work with, will think they just freak out if they see over 3,000, over $5,000 in chiropractic fees. That is ridiculous. I don't know where they come up with that stuff. Again, I'm using Utah, but the average visit, we can bill up to $350 a visit. Granted, the insurance is only gonna, they, they're happy to pay $350 a visit for 10 visits and say you're done. They're like, great, awesome. They don't care about the cost per visit. But if we can charge a better rate, uh, a better average, and actually see them for the course of care, so we're treating the patient to fruition or maximum medical improvement, everybody wins. So the average visit for us, for example, costs 140 to 170. The allowable is 350. Well, a grade one, that's between 2,900 and 3,500. A grade two, that's between 46 and, and 5,600. A grade three, which you're going to see the most often in your office, is between 10 and 12,000. Now, in some states where they have higher PIP, people are doing this all the time. But in the states where the, they either don't have a lot of personal injury protection or no personal injury protection, they only have med pay, which is voluntary. And so some people don't have any coverage. So docs are only you know, doing like $2,000 worth of services and then cutting them loose or whatever. We, If you're trained and certified in this stuff and you're working with the right attorneys that get trained in this stuff, I don't care what state you're in. You should be able to make some pretty good money serving in personal injury. And, uh, you know, that's just simple stuff. That's just adjustments. That's not even combining the ice and e-stem and massage and all the different things that you can do in your office. So when the attorneys are balking at, oh, my gosh, if it's over $5,000, they're just uneducated. Uh, they need to understand, or the insurance companies, too. They need to be properly educated, which is easy to do with the right letters and the right research, that uh, they shouldn't, they shouldn't uh, box us, uh, paint us in a corner or put us in a box like that. All right, so piecing the puzzle together, an interdisciplinary team or treatment approach really gives the patient the best care. So if you're working with kids, try to work with their pediatricians if you can. You don't have to, but it's helpful. If you don't like working with kids, Find a chiropractor in your area that's really good with pediatrics, that's done the certification courses for that, and, you know, just have a co-referral thing with them. We should be referring more to each other. I mean, we are, we are not competition with each other as chiropractors. We are co-opetition. And the more we start to specialize in areas and, and co-refer to each other like medical doctors do, the better we build our, our group, uh, build our profession, and build better relationships across the borders with medical doctors and physical therapies and things like that. So it's building some bridges over those fences. It's kind of nice. Know the guidelines. Learn how to document them properly. It, the attorneys will love you for it and it will help because it will help them litigate their cases better, which is going to lead to more referrals for you. We all have our specialty. Recognize your specialty. Run with it. It's awesome. Uh, okay. The last thing I want to point out is uh, that we... Uh, are with the Whiplash Group, and as with the Whiplash Group, we do seminars to help train doctors and attorneys together. It's awesome because we have medical doctors, chiropractic physicians, and attorneys all sitting in the audience in these seminars, and it is such a cool thing to see our chiropractors just light up and get fired up with uh, their specialty and philosophy and then getting trained in, in personal injury and building bridges with these attorneys and these medical doctors that they're like, oh, I had no idea you guys knew this stuff. And when we all know the medical, legal, lingo, lingo together, uh, we're better able to serve our patients in our community and start building bridges where there's been, unfortunately, fences for years between different professions. Uh, one of our upcoming seminars is March 17th through, or 15th through the 17th. It's in Salt Lake City. If you like skiing, come a day early or stay a day late and get some, get some good skiing in. But we have a fantastic lineup of a multi, we have 12 speakers, a um, couple different tracks going at the same time. It's a buffet of information. You're going to love it. And I look forward to seeing some of our doctors uh, 
in March in Salt Lake City if they can make it. Just check us out at whiplashgroup.org. Any questions? Yes, so it looks like we have one question, Dr. Shetland. It says, where do you find relative value fees? That is a great question. I would check first with your association. Different states uh, have them. In some states, it's odd that the major medical insurance creates them every, for our state, for example, every other year they're generated by a major medical insurance company, but they're completely different than the major medical insurance company rates. Personal injury is a completely different animal. And uh, that's where we get ours from now. I believe Nevada didn't even have any. I don't know what state you're in, if you can tell me. But Nevada didn't have any, and they hired a, an outside professional to come in and actually create those for them. So now they do have them. Uh, so, yeah, check with your state association. They're going to have the link to where to get them. Yeah, and this particular doctor was from Kansas. Okay. So yeah, so for Kansas, I, I would just thank you for asking, and I would just encourage you to check with your association first. And if you still can't find anything, reach out to me, and let's see if I can't shake the tree and get some leaves to fall where we can find something in your state. Well, I have to say I love to start off a new year and a new webinar, you know, the new year of the new webinar series with a bang. Dr. Shetton, you have definitely done that. Um, Thank you so much for being here today, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Just a reminder, next week we have Everyday Celebrations in Your Office with Miss Phyllis Frey Charette from Parker University and Parker Seminars, who is going to talk about putting the sizzle back in your chiropractic office, how you and your staff can get excited about chiropractic again, because let's be honest. We all tend to get a little burnout out from time to time, getting bogged down in the daily. Um, and so finding that, getting that excitement and getting uh, just lit up about chiropractic again, um, it really translate to the, translates to our patients. And it gets them fired up and excited about chiropractic as well. And I can't think of a better time of the year when we want to spread that love and that joy within our communities than right now. So if you haven't registered yet, make sure that you do. And then we're going to follow that up with the perfect soap note um, with Dr. Evan William, also from the uh, great state of Utah. Um, and I will say this, if you make it out to this seminar in March, Salt Lake City, hands down, I've been everywhere all across this amazing country. Been to Alaska three times. It's my favorite place I've visited so far, but a very close second um, and probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever been was Salt Lake City earlier or late last year. Um, so if you have the opportunity to go, and I can't ski because I'm kind of a klutz, but um, you know, what better place to give it a world than when you're going to be with other chiropractors at this convention? So give it a, if you can make it, I really do encourage you to do so. Um, and it's a beautiful location. Um, that week we have Dr. William, we will also be having Balancing Your Practice in the New Year. This is a collaborative webinar. Um, we're doing this on Wednesday, so we're going to have two back to back with Dr. Adam Rodnick. Dr. Ray Foxworth from Cover Health USA, Miss Yvette Noel from KMC University. If you haven't heard her speak live and in person or on a webinar, you've missed out. Let me just tell you, she is fiery and fun, and she's really going to shake this up. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration with the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress um, and, the found, and with Foot Levelers, Cover Health USA. They're uh, basically how to kick off the new year in your practice, and then we're going to close out the month um, with some great information on online marketing with Dr. Nick Silveri. Um, so I'm super, super, super excited about the lineup. We actually have most of our webinars posted through March, um, and it's really exciting to see people registering for them now and how quickly those numbers are going up. Just know that uh, Dr. Shetland did go over a lot of information, incredible information, and I know you guys, y'all are taking notes like crazy. Just know that you can go back, watch this webinar. It's available. It will be available in the archives starting tomorrow. You can look it up by his name, 
by the topic of discussion. You can even scroll down and just look for January 2019, um, and it will be available for a year. So I encourage you to watch it again. Share it with your colleagues um, that you know are interested or working with children or personal injury. This is really whether you're working with personal injury or even working with kids in general. You have patients who have children. You have patients who are getting involved in automobile accidents. Every chiropractor really needs to know this information um, so that they know somebody like Dr. Shelton they can refer these patients to in these moments. So I encourage you to share this webinar. You don't have to be a Cover Health USA member to watch it. So share it. Watch it as many times as you want to. Be on the lookout. I don't say this very often, but we will definitely be having Dr. Shetland back um, later in 2019 because when you have the opportunity to have somebody this amazing on your webinar series, you ask them as many times as you possibly can um, and take advantage of that relationship. And I am not above that or below it. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thank y'all so very much. I missed y'all over the holidays. I cannot wait to see you at the same time, same place next week when we have Miss Phyllis Bray Charette, who is a first timer to the webinar series. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and a fabulous week. And I will see y'all next time. Bye bye.